Welcome to this webinar series produced by the Commission on Cancer, which reviews the optimal resources for Cancer Care 2020 standards. This webinar will review Chapter 5. Remember, the 2020 standards will be effective January 1, 2020. I would urge you to review all information in our manual because there are certain changes to the accreditation process which will be offered. There are new terms defined in the glossary, and there are specifications by each of our accreditation categories. Next slide. Remember to also access the 2020 Standards and Resources page in our website for more information on the standards and certainly upcoming educational activities. Next slide. Standard Chapter 5 involves patient care, expectations, and protocols. Next slide. What are patient care expectations? Well, they involve psychosocial well-being, the quality of cancer surgery provided at the institution, and this is a new standard on operative standards for cancer surgery, and completeness of operative and pathology reports. Next slide. Standard Chapter 5.1 involves CAP synoptic reporting. The scope of this standard shows that eligible cancer pathology reports must be in a synoptic format and that 90% of these reports must be reported synoptically. They must contain all core data elements within the synoptic format. Now, the synoptic format is a very structured format that includes all of the following. It must include the core elements that are reported, whether applicable or not, reported in a diagnostic parameter pair format, which is offered in the CAP guidelines, and then on a separate line or in a tabular format to achieve visual separation all core elements listed together in a synoptic format in one location must be in the pathology report. Next slide. Now the scope of the standard refers to the CAP cancer protocols which are available certainly online or from the College of American Pathologists and these are of course obtained by your pathology group. They give specific guidance and examples of all of the core elements for the cancer sites that are reported. Now, the eligible cancer pathology reports show that definitive surgical resection of primary invasive malignancies and ductal carcinoma in situ, and also include definitive surgical resection in patients who have received neoadjuvant therapy and who have residual tumors. Next slide. There are exceptions to the CAP cancer protocol. Definitive surgical resections in which no residual tumor is present, and this may be certainly uh, seen in patients with neoadjuvant therapy, or additional surgical procedures performed after definitive resection, for example, resection of a positive margin, or a node biopsy or resection uh, may, may not be reported in this format. Diagnostic biopsies, cytology specimens, or other diagnostic procedures done before definitive surgical therapy, surgical resections for recurrent tumors, in situ carcinomas, except for ductal carcinoma in situ, or special studies, for example, biomarkers or prognostic testing are not included in this specific standard. Next slide. Now, the on-site documentation will be reviewed by the site reviewer, as has previously uh, been done uh, in the past. Standardized synoptic pathology reports must be eligible uh, for patients for the site review. Next slide. Compliance is based on review and a 90% compliance with these eligible pathology reports in a synoptic format defined by the College of American Pathologists and must contain all the core data elements within the synoptic 
format. So there are two things that mean compliance, synoptic format and having the core elements in those synoptic formats. Next slide. Standard 5.2 deals with psychosocial distress screening. Now the scope of the standard must include whether the psychosocial services are provided on site or by referral. It is the role of the Cancer Committee to implement this policy and procedure and to review the policy and procedure annually. They must monitor the psychosocial distress screening process and the referral for psychosocial care. The process must be evaluated, documented, and reported on an annual basis. And the services addressed may include physical services, psychological, social, spiritual or financial needs of the cancer patient. Next slide. Now further, the process must identify issues which interfere with treatment and affect the outcome of our cancer patients. And again, these include psychosocial, social, financial, and behavioral issues. We must have a document that provides the sources of referral for psychosocial needs, whether it's in the facility or outside the facility. Patients must be screened for distress at least one time during the patient's first course of treatment. But additional screenings provided by the cancer program or health provider uh, may be given on the discretion of the institution. Next slide. Psychosocial distress screening does have exceptions. Patients with biopsy only or our class of case 00 patients may not be screened by this process. Patients who are admitted to the hospital with a history of cancer, but for non-cancer related issues do not meet the screening needs. And inpatients with a current diagnosis of cancer who are treated for a non-cancer issue and do not receive cancer treatment may be outside of this standard. Next slide. The scope of the standard deals how it is administered. It's determined by the Cancer Committee and those dealing with the psychosocial screening process as to how the process is administered. And it's tailored to the workflow of the particular practice at the hospital. It could be administered by medical staff, medical assistants, nurses, or social workers. The policy and procedure must clearly address the sites where the screening takes place, including uh, the COC accredited facility or designated providers who work in those facilities, and include the process for assessment and treatment of distress. Next slide. The Cancer Committee must select and approve the psychosocial distress screening tool to be administered. This should be a standardized validated instrument or a tool with an established clinical cutoff. Now the cancer committee can set the cutoff score used to identify the distressed patients. The patients must be assessed for distress through direct patient contact. And direct contact means discussion of these results with the patient face-to-face -face by telephone or by telemedicine. This assessment confirms screening results and identifies the appropriate referrals as needed. Excellent. The scope of the standard must show that in the policy and procedure, the screening process, the timing of the screening, the identified tool used for screening, and the distress level which triggers referral to certain services must be clearly stated. The distress screening or screenings results, the referral for provision of care, and any follow-up are documented in the patient's medical record to facilitate integrated and high-quality care. Now, the psychosocial services coordinator must oversee this activity and report this to the Cancer Committee each year. Next slide. The annual psychosocial services summary should include, but it certainly is not limited to, how many patients did we screen? The number of patients referred for distress resources or further follow-up, and where the patients were referred to. 
if they were on site or by referral as a result of the screening process. Next slide. The PRQ should clearly document that patients were either screened on site or by referral, that the psychosocial distress screening policy and procedure exists and is updated, and that annual psychosocial services summaries are given to the Cancer Committee. Next slide. Now, the compliance is based on the policies and procedures that are in place to provide patient access to these psychosocial services, which is either on-site or by referral. The Cancer Committee must implement a policy and procedure that includes all the requirements for providing and monitoring psychosocial distress and referral for our patients. Cancer patients must be screened for psychosocial distress at least annually during the first course of treatment and reported to the process. And the psychosocial distress screening process must be evaluated and documented and reported to the Cancer Committee by the Psychosocial Services Coordinator. The coordinator's report includes all required elements and is documented carefully in the Cancer Committee minutes. Next slide. Standard 5.3 begins a very important series of standards which are new to our 2020 standards and which are phase-in standards. And these involve the methodology by which patients undergo surgical procedures. Standard 5.3 covers how a sentinel node biopsy is performed for breast cancer patients. And this is meant to ensure that sentinel node mapping or sentinel lymphadenectomy, the removal of the sentinel node, provides accurate information for our breast cancer staging and that all sentinel nodes for breast cancers must be identified, removed, and subjected to pathological analysis. Now, sentinel nodes are identified as those nodes having the uptake or the localization of any substrate, such as a radioactive tracer or a colored dye that has been given or injected into the affected breast with cancer. The node uh, must be uh, able to identify the colored lymphatics which travel to the node or show that dominant lymph nodes that are suspicious as identified by the operating surgeon are also removed. This standard is satisfied in a diligent search and has been made for sentinel nodes which those nodes remove when present and documented for those specific indications. Next slide. Now, in order to provide the information for this, there should be a synoptic operative report. And the surgeons working at your institution should be well aware of the need for synoptic operative reports for those doing breast surgery and sentinel node biopsy. This slide covers the information that should be in the element as well as the response for a synoptic report of a breast sentinel node. And I urge you to look at the manual and to review all of these processes with the surgeons providing sentinel node biopsy by your institution. These will be reviewed by the site visitor during the accreditation process. Next slide. This standard applies to patients undergoing nodal staging in a curative setting for patients having breast cancers of epithelial origin, our classical ductal and lobular carcinomas, not patients with sarcomas or other types of cancer. Next slide. Now, the documentation will be reviewed by the site visitor. The synoptic operative report will be required and is actually in the process of review and creation by the Commission on Cancer as we speak. Patients with breast cancer or epithelial origin who undergo nodal staging must have this synoptic report available for the accreditation process. Next slide. The compliance regarding this particular standard will be based on all sentinel nodes for breast cancer that are identified, removed, and subjected to pathological analysis. 
the operative report for patients undergoing breast sentinel node biopsy must include these minimal elements in a synoptic format. Next slide. Standard 5.4 is a continuation of a standard for our breast cancer patients and involves the methodology to provide breast axillary dissection. Again, this is a phase in standard. Axillary dissection for breast cancer constitutes removal of level one and level two lymph nodes within a certain anatomical area uh, in the axilla. Now, these also must preserve key neurovascular structures uh, by the time and while doing these types of biopsies. Now, these axillary lymph nodes dissection is a staging as well as a therapeutic process uh, and has two purposes for our breast cancer patients. It provides important staging information and prognostic information on the future of our breast cancer patients and also provides local control in certain settings where sentinel node biopsy, medical oncology therapy and endocrine therapies and radiotherapies have not yet demonstrated adequate local control within the axilla. Next slide. Now, breast axillary dissection is based on a standard that has to satisfy the dissection in an established way in the axillary boundaries. And that is well-defined and well-documented and should be in the armamentarium of all surgeons providing breast cancer surgery at your institution. Now, level three nodes, which are the highest axillary nodes, may be removed if clinically involved or suspicious at the operation, although the benefit of the removal uh, is not clearly supported uh, by uh, data. Programs are encouraged to review the number of lymph nodes retrieved in patients who do not receive neoadjuvant therapy. Next slide. This slide again shows the synoptic report that may be included uh, when the axillary dissection is performed by surgeons at your facility. And these really follow minimum elements uh, in the synoptic format, both the element and the response. And this will be reviewed during the accreditation process by your on-site reviewer. And this is included in your manual for further review. Next slide. This standard applies to patients undergoing axillary dissection with diagnostic or therapeutic intent for patients having breast cancers, again, of epithelial origin, ductal carcinoma and lobular carcinoma. Next slide. The on-site documentation will be reviewed by your site visitor, and this will include the standardized synoptic operative report for patients with breast cancer. And these will be offered to institutions as developed by the Commission on Cancer. Next slide. Compliance will be based on the axillary dissection that is performed and reported, as well as the operative report for patients showing the minimum elements in a synoptic format. Next slide. Standard 5.5 involves patients who have cutaneous melanoma at your institution. And again, this is a phase in standard. Clinical margin width uh, is important in the management of cutaneous melanoma and should be clearly reported by any surgeons providing melanoma care at your institution. For melanomas that are less than one millimeter thick, which is known as a Breslow classification, there should be at least a centimeter around that melanoma. For melanomas one to two millimeters thick, one to two centimeters of skin should be removed. And for melanomas greater than two millimeters in thickness, two centimeters should be removed around the invasive melanoma. Now the margin width for these wide local excisions is based on the Breslow thickness of the primary tumor. The margin is measured circumferentially at the level of the skin from either residual gross tumor 
and or the previous biopsy scar. And these are included in the Operative Standards for Cancer Surgery, Volume 2, which is also published by the American College of Surgeons and should be reviewed for this particular standard. Next slide. As in previous discussion, this standard includes certain synoptic elements that are shown clearly in the operative report and reported by the surgeon providing melanoma care. These should be reviewed by the Cancer Committee as well as all surgeons providing melanoma care at the institution and will be reviewed by the site visitor during the accreditation process. Next slide. The standard applies to patients undergoing curative intent by wide local excision of a primary cutaneous melanoma. Next slide. The on-site documentation will be provided by reviewing of a standardized synoptic operative report for patients undergoing these curative intents. And again, these standard optive, synoptic reports are being developed uh, during this uh, time frame. That's why this is a uh, phase in standard. Next slide. Now, how is compliance measured? Well, again, it's measured by clinical margin width, which I've already stated and should be reviewed certainly by the Cancer Committee and all members of the melanoma treatment team. And the operative report on how this wide local excision is reported. Next slide. Standard 5.6 follows this concept of synoptic reporting for cancer patients. This is again a phase in standard and involves colon cancer reporting. Now, the important thing about colon cancer operations is that proximal vascular ligation with removal of the appropriate lymph nodes for a colon cancer operation is vitally important. And this is why the number of lymph nodes is important as a quality indicator uh, when this is reviewed by the Cancer Committee. Now, the operative standards for cancer surgery, volume one, will review all of these requirements for a success, successful colon resection and should be reviewed by surgeons as well as the Cancer Committee prior to the phase in of this particular standard. Next slide. As in, for, as in the other discussions, the operative reports uh, are included uh, in a synoptic format. On this slide shows how this synoptic format should be reported and is shown also in our manual of the 2020 standards and should be reviewed by the Cancer Committee as well as all physicians taking care of colon cancer at the facility. Next slide. The standard applies to all curative resections for colon cancer and applies to all operative approaches, whether they're robotic, laparoscopic, or traditional open approaches for colon cancer. Next slide. Now, the on-site documentation will re be reviewed by the site visitor. Uh, these standardized synoptic operative reports uh, will be reviewed uh, and will be uploaded into the PRQ. Next slide. Resection of the tumor bearing bowel segment and the complete lymph node dissection will be part of the compliance for this particular standard. And the operative report must include how the resection is done and include the minimum elements in a synoptic format for providing a colon resection for our cancer patients. Next slide. Standard 5.7 involves the management of our rectal cancer patients and includes the concept of a total mesorectal excision. And again, this is a phase in standard. Now, a total mesorectal excision is the gold standard of providing operative care for rectal cancer patients and involves removing the appropriate tissue plane in providing a complete resection, as well as removing lymph nodes for resecting rectal cancer. This should be clearly reviewed by all surgeons at your facility who provide rectal cancer measurement management. And just as 
we have stated previously, the operative standards for cancer surgery, volume two, page 194, include how a total mesorectal excision should be performed. Next slide. Now, the College of American Pathologists has defined guidelines for reviewing the completeness of a total mesorectal excision. So for this particular standard, not only will the, the operative format be important, but the pathology format will document the appropriateness and curative intent of the total mesorectal excision. So here again, at the time of accreditation review, the pathology reports must be reviewed in a synoptic format for this particular 5.7 standard. Next slide. This standard applies to operations for curative intent with radical resections of rectal adenocarcinoma, but excludes those that have local excision as a management strategy. Next slide. The on-site documentation will be reviewed by the site visitor. And again, the standardized synoptic pathology report will be the report reviewed for this particular standard for middle and low rectal cancer management. Next slide. Compliance will be measured by patients who have undergone total mesorectal excision uh, at your facility for mid and low rectal cancers, and the completeness of the mesorectal excision as defined by the pathologist. And the quality of this TME, or mesorectal excision, must be documented clearly in the pathology reports. Next slide. Standard 5.8 is a continuation and includes how our patients with lung cancer are managed for pulmonary resections. The surgical pathology report, again, will be the important element that is reviewed for this particular standard. Lymph nodes from at least one hyalur station will be reviewed and at least three distinct mediastinal stations will be reviewed in those undergoing pulmonary resection. So it's vitally important that the surgeons providing lung cancer management, as well as the pathologists providing lung cancer pathology review must be involved in this standard. So review of the College of American Pathologists protocols for reporting pulmonary resection are especially important and that surgeons are expected to identify the histology requisition from the stations that they are operating on for lung cancer patients. So it's important that all of these elements are reported during this phase in process. Next slide. The standard applies to the primary surgical procedure for curative intent for our patients with non-small cell lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, and carcinoid tumors on the lung, and the standard applies to all operative approaches for lung cancer management. Next slide. The on-site documentation will re be reviewed by the site visitor during the accreditation process, and the standardized synoptic pathology report will be reviewed for this particular standard, uh, not the synoptic operative report. Next slide. Compliance for pulmonary resection will be based on the surgical pathology report that is generated and must include hyalur lymph node review as well as mediastinal lymph node review by the pathology group. The nodal stations examined by the pathologist must be documented in any patients undergoing curative pulmonary resection at your institution. Next slide. Now, the implementation of these operative standards uh, must be reviewed certainly by the Cancer Committee, your Director of Surgery, your Chair of Surgery at your institution, your Cancer Liaison Physician, your Cancer Program Medical Director, and certainly all physicians that are involved in the surgical or pathology management of these particular patients with these standards. Now, synoptic reporting templates currently are in development and will be developed very soon and offered to our cancer programs 
so stay tuned and visit the websites involved. This completes our review of Chapter 5. Thank you.